explain to us how you kind of come to this project. 88. Um, it's a project that was a long time in the making. April and I first um, came up with the idea, actually, I think I was in theater school, it's like 10 years ago, when I, I actually read an article in the newspaper about a uh, person, it's the first time I actually read about it, the Associative View State, and it was a gentleman who came to on a plane uh, just as a backpack. He didn't know where he was or, or what happened, and what they found out is he actually had been missing for three months. He had somehow, in that time he was missing, flown from BC, Canada to South America, was painting, and he was uh, keeping up in some sort of apartment and just living a weird life and I, I was like fascinated by it so April and I started talking about it and then uh, we just sort of became obsessed with it but at the time we were doing a lot of comedies and so we just had to wait for the right time and then we developed the script and, and then 88 happened. And then, and then how did the, uh, you got an amazing cast? Yes. How did that kind of come into place? Um, a bunch of different ways. Catherine was actually late to the game. We, we wrote the role. Um, we actually wrote it. We just were really passionate about getting a very um, driven, passionate actress for the role, and uh, we didn't really have anybody in mind. And then it was sort of close to filming, and uh, we, we just couldn't find anybody quite right. And then Catherine's name came across the table, and we were like, I don't know why we didn't think of her earlier. And she loved the material, and we just instantly hit it off, and then she came to it and was great. Whereas, like, Christopher Lloyd, we wrote it with him in mind. He was in our last film, Dead Before Dawn 3D, and he played again like a very Christopher Lloyd type of role. He was very large and, and we just enjoyed working with him so much, and he loved working with us, and, and so we said, it would be really great to give uh, Christopher, because he's, he's a dynamic actor, and people don't see that. He does plays all the time, he's obsessed with theater, he goes to New York still and sees Broadway, and he's really, he reads all the time, he's so literary. He, re he reads book after book after book. Anytime I meet with him, he's like, oh yeah, I just finished like a hundred different books that I wouldn't ever even be able to touch. And so we're like, you know, it'd be nice to give him something that sort of juxtaposes a lot of the roles he does. Um, and became known for, him. and so uh, we, we wrote it for him, and, and he loved it, and, and it was so nice having him too. Because you produced, yeah, produced. You wrote the script, wrote the script, yeah. And you're in it, and, and yeah. So yeah. How do you handle being? Because that's three separate disciplines. Yeah. And you have know, three separate heads. How yes. Gonna... I just take my other heads off when I come into these sorts of situations, stuff behind closed doors. Um, April and I started together. We started as actors, and um, our first feature film was a little mockumentary called Rock, Paper, Scissors, The Way to Foster, which actually did really well in the UK. You guys were the greatest audience ever uh, for that film. Anyway, um, we just became used to it from the beginning, sort of learning how to make a film on your own, and, and, and the producing side sort of came through that grassroots style, and this was our uh, fourth feature, so uh, we really don't, don't know any other way other than, you know, we do the, the film together, we come up with the concept, come up with the visuals, all that sort of thing, so it was just sort of very organic. So, um, with Christopher, how do you kind of cope, because He's very iconic. He must yes. come with a little bit of baggage. Uh, he, he is the, I am not kidding, he is the sweetest man you will ever meet. And by far the most professional. It's the first thing we noticed even on Dead Before Dawn. Everybody says that. It's 100% true. Literally, we are doing Dead Before Dawn, just as an example of who Christopher is and like his character as a human being. Um, we shot that in Niagara Falls during the largest heat wave Niagara Falls I've ever seen. And we were shooting in an unconditioned, unair conditioned, um, pawn shop in Port Colburn. It was 42 degrees Celsius inside. We had no air conditioning, and because we were shooting 3D, we had two cameras. It was a massive break, and it was just blasting hot air. Literally, we had like extra shirts on standby because you do two takes, and the shirt would be soaked through. And Christopher is not young anymore. I mean, he's he's in his 70s. And it was funny because we had all the we had, like the young teenage cast, and they're all like, "Hey, what's going on?" And they get in there, and in between takes, they always just like, oh, it's "So hot, it's so hot." And even I'd be like, oh, "I'm so hot." And you look over to Christopher, and he wouldn't say a word. In between takes, you'd go, he'd sit down, he'd be like, Christopher, you need anything? He'd be like, no, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, there's a little bit of water. Like, completely grounded, and so passionate about his work. And I, I cannot say enough nice things about Christopher Lloyd. He's one of the more exciting <coughs> people I've met. No, no, obviously, April director. We yes. can't have too many women doing genre stuff. So, because oh, he, he met in films, uh, sorry, actor school. Theater school, yes. Theater. So, the jump from acting to directing, how did that happen? For her, that yeah. is very, very natural. If anybody here ever meets April, you find she's just a natural directing uh, director. Well, she's bossy. She's a, not bossy at all. Just she comes from a family, a large family. She's the oldest of four girls. Her father, her parents own a garden market that she was always very active in. And from the time she was this high, um, her entire family and her extended family, who's all very close, will tell you that she was always the one that was like organizing these events. No, nobody told her to do that. She would just do it. She, 
she'd like organize massive events and they'd all come in and have these dance shows, she'd make tickets, she'd do the, you know, costumes and she just continued that way. She decided when she was five, like, to become an actress and her parents didn't even understand that, they owned a garden market. She's like, look, I've done this acting school, I'd like to go to this acting school, I'd like to start at this time, I'll take these classes and just, that's continued through the years. She's just a person that can shoulder so many burdens and uh, she's just salt of the earth. It's lucky, I, I was so lucky to meet her. Cool. Yeah. Right, so I have uh, questions. There we go. I just wait for the microphone to come down. And don't forget, I, I have two yeah, wiener mugs. <laughs> Once you see the prize, you'll probably take the question back. <laughs> <laughs> yes, on you go. Um, so, writing a film like that. Um, so who the fuck's that? Oh, hi! Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it was meant to be for him, here. Oh, right. I'm take the mic, take it back. <laughs> oh. We'll come back to you in a second. This man here. Sorry. Who asked the question before? Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's going to seem a really little silly point, but who's, where did the idea for business time, leisure time, and a remote control come from? Oh my God. No. This is, that scene, let me see, is we were doing this, and if you ever go back and trace our earlier work, I, I am a huge fan of sort of more random humor. I'm a huge fan of like strange visual aesthetics and quirks that characters have in those transpiring to the screen. And of course we were making this film which was a, you know, a psychological thriller and there isn't so much room for that sort of fun. And so when we were writing the script, let me see, it was just this one self-contained scene where they had to go and pick up some ammunition, learn about some stuff, and some stuff had to happen. And it was the one scene where we really had to, were able to have some fun um, in the writing of it and in the, in the creating of it. And that was April, the, the director and my partner, that was her who played Lenny. That was, uh, April, um, and, and so it was just something from the beginning, you always knew that, and that's sort of where the leisure time, business time came from, because we were clashing with like that sort of idea, separating the two. Ask your question, now, go on. And just in, in writing a film, uh, writing a story, yeah. um, in the, it must be quite difficult with the fugue state, yeah. um, not to either spoil things or let the cat out of the bag so early on in the film. How, yeah. how did you find the process for writing? It was um, a very specific and arduous process. And we had, uh, when we were writing and beating up the story, April and I, when we were writing in, in our office, we had an entire wall that was dedicated to the whole story. And actually, on, on when, anyway, the, the, it was very specific because what we wanted it to do from the very beginning is it's, it, we wanted to go back and forth the whole way through so it sort of was like a continuous infinity sign, and then it actually is circled because it like ends right where it starts. So it was, we had to really be mathematical about it, because we also wanted each section to be the exact same point, and we wanted to start from her, she's coming out of this fugue state, she's piecing these things together. So it's like really, she's trying to figure out what's going on, and then it slows down as you go on. But again, for an audience, it's very easy to A, lose the audience, and it's also then you don't want to give away too much, like you said. So what we did is we just really specifically out each different thing. So we have the present state timeline, we have the fugue state timeline. We knew everything that had to happen in the present and everything that had to happen in the fugue. So we put it all out, sort of like a big puzzle, and then we figure out how we could connect them all so that it sort of just lived in that world together. And then when we did that, that was that. And then we had to also, you know, add her past life into it. So it was, it was very delicate balancing it um, overall. And even when we got in the editing room, it was a whole new thing because you see visual clues and you, you know, you have to always balance that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, Chuck, right at the very back, on the end end of the the, uh, the row. Hi, I've uh, got two questions. First yeah. of all, I noticed... No, 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 one. Sorry, okay, just <laughs> one then. Um, I noticed Lynn Griffin in a small role as the uh, waitress who, of course, is in yes. the original Black Christmas. Was that a deliberate casting choice? Were you... We were so lucky to get her. Um, again, we shot in Canada, and um, we just were in Canada. You just have a lot of Canadian actors that have been around for for a long time, and she just happened to be available. And when we found out that she was, we were really excited, and and uh, it fit, just fit perfectly. And she's also very lovely. <laughs> okay, I'll your second one. Go on. <laughs> And of course, um, you said you wrote for Christopher Lloyd, um, yeah. and of course, 88 miles per hour, if that has to be a deliberate Back to the Future. It wasn't it. even! It's the, best, <laughs> it's the best coincidence in the world! To, to get really corny and lame, the 88, what it represents is, 
uh, we always thought of the movie, we always thought it as an infinity sign. And so, you know, you turn that up, you get an eight. And so it's sort of like two infinity signs, one represents her present state, one represents her future state, but together it's 88. Um, and we also just like the symbolism of the number um, in general. And you thought, fucking yawning over there. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's sort of where it is. And then when Christopher came in, and we could think about, you know, it has to hit 88 miles per hour, now you're going to see some serious shit, then we were really excited. So. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, right next to where you are, Mark. You've went in some depth about Christopher Lloyd, but what about uh, the legend? Ironside? Uh, Michael Ironside. <laughs> Michael Ironside. <laughs> I don't even know. Like, that's what the VHS, I think. <laughs> he's a, I think he's a legend for a reason. He, so when we, were, when we were shooting, he said that our film was his 244th feature film production. <laughs> and he comes on set like he's been on 244 feature film productions. <laughs> he knows exactly what he's doing. Like, it's crazy because we have a lot of young crew and, and, um, working on our film. And he came in and everybody immediately, it's like, it's like the principal coming into your classroom when you're in grade 8 or, you know, 13 years old. You're all just like, yes, Mr. Ryan. It's like, yes, obviously. Yeah, what can I get you? Anything? And he's just like, listen, this is how we're going to do this. You know, yes, Mr. Ryan. said, okay, thank you so much. But he's actually then, he has this like steely demeanor in, in one of those great ways. You know those people that, they're like, you know, you're very intimidated, but then, you know, you, two minutes later, he's like, you're all right, kid. You know what I mean? That type of thing. And very open and, and great. It was, it was a real honor, actually, to be even next to him. You definitely, you feel that, like, his presence, you feel that when he walks into a room. That isn't just something he puts on. He's just like a ball of, he's like a supernova. He's like a nucleus. His weight is just energetic mass. <laughs> sort of went off on it. He's a great guy. <laughs> yeah, that's the answer to the question. Uh, yes, uh, lady over there. Yeah. That would be a good question. We've got the hammer left. Let's drop a stop here. Um, I find the, the music... It's a real hammer that works. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> yes. um, and it seems to be a really important part of the movie. How yes. did you find and choose the music that was... Yeah, um, music is inadvertently become something that's really important to April and I when we're making the film, and we really love, uh, you know, letting the piece sort of connect to character in the film. And we were blessed. We actually have a lot of talented friends in Niagara Falls. So a lot of that film, and a lot of talented friends in general. A lot of that film was commissioned, or a lot of that music was commissioned specifically for for the film. Like the the song that's on the radio, um, we just sort of discussed the lyrics with a really talented artist in Niagara, and she created that. And um, Breakdown song is a friend of ours by the name of Peter Katz. So we were just very deliberate with the music that we chose. And then other stuff, um, we just do our own music supervision. So we just handpick all of the music. And, and so why Niagara Falls? Because that's it's more than one film in Niagara Falls. We have shot all of our films in Niagara Falls, Ontario, Canada, or tax in our surrounding areas. Uh, it, well, tax breaks is one of them. Yes, that is very important. <laughs> but it's also equals from Niagara Falls. There are other red wine there. Yes, there is. They, there's a part of Niagara Falls, I mean, a lot of people think of Niagara Falls, they think of the falls, and they think of, you know, the, like, carnival-esque type of feel of it, but there's also, like, an old downtown in Niagara Falls that's very dilapidated and, and, and has a feel of, you know, it feels like it hasn't been touched since 1980. Think about the season. Yes, yeah, exactly, exactly. And, um, I don't know, there's just an interesting feel in a lot of the town, and for the work we've made up until this point in our careers, it just always seems to be very fitting for that. And plus, it's a family affair. I mean, a lot of the Mullins from there, a lot of the Blaine's from there. It's the haunted house story. Which, the, the, the like, one in Clifton Hill? The one, no, the actual, there's an attraction haunted house where you kind of go into it and it's dark. And oh, everything's still there. Oh, everything's yeah. still there, yeah. I felt it was a shit scared in my life. Yeah, that's still there. Right. That's one where the real people come. No, no, this is a kind of like, it's one, one of these things where you go into a dark room and somebody kind of touches you on the shoulder and you go, fuck me. Oh, yeah. Off. Yeah. <laughs> Who said that? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's it, yeah. I it's, there, it's there. I didn't come off well. I don't, I don't go into those things. I refuse. No, no, no. Yeah, you come out and then Paul and I went, and we were running so fast no. to get out of it. The man who was actually chasing us came whizzing out as well. It's, it's the worst thing I've ever heard in my life. Considering what I do, it was embarrassing. It's, it's the worst thing I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry. Um, on. Yes, Niagara Falls, great place. Any more? There's a hand up there, or just two hands? Oh, a gentleman over there, yeah. Man in the corner. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I didn't want to say that. Sammy. 
Sammen. Okay. At the very beginning, the, you told us about the huge thing. Um, I wondered if you'd done test screenings and the audience had been too confused. We have, we have, we've done. It's funny. There was two things that went back and forth a lot through test screenings, and at the end of the day, we opted to. We had. Okay, I'll tell you what they are, and then I'll tell you what we decided to do. It was the fugue state definition off the top, and it was um, the vehicle we used, which is called step backs, we call them, those little refreshers in between when you go between the present state and the fugue state um, that run throughout the film. We did numerous tests, uh, uh, test screenings, obviously because of the nature of it and how it intertwines, and we continually got, this was sort of our best resting place in the sense where more, most people got it, and then a couple of people would be like, yeah, man, why'd you put those step backs in? Stupid, I got the film without it. What do you think of a dummy? Come on. <laughs> but then others were like, I'm glad you did that because I didn't know what was going on. So we had to make a decision at that point when we were getting these final things. Do we make this for a mass audience that we can share with and we make sure that we don't isolate anyone? Or do we make it for, um, make it very difficult on the audience? And April and I are just someone where we love film so much and we want to make film for people to enjoy. We decided to go with make it for the largest audience that we possibly can make it for. Um, because we just, you know, we want to share our stuff with that particular audience and they're sort of isolated. If that makes any sense. So we'll one more question and we'll get on to the getting away from us. Okay. So we'll say, Jen at the back, please hand up. No, that wasn't you, it was somebody else. <laughs> yeah, there you are, thank you. <laughs> yeah. At least I got the sex right this time. Last year, <laughs> last year when I was doing a question, I called the man a girl. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not particularly big on cars, but there was an awful lot of iconic American muscle cars in it. Was that intentional or just because they look fucking good? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's something, that's also something that has been, I find with my scripts, I don't know why um, I'll be sort of vague on a lot of stuff, and then I'll be like, with cars that are in the movie, I'll be very specific with the cars that I want in there. Um, so it actually was sort of a specific sort of vision that we wanted to have these older, very <coughs> symbolic vehicles, like that was the, the red. Um, old school, I think it's a 69 Ford Mustang, and then the El Camino, who, can, who doesn't love an El Camino? I mean, that's amazing. So, yeah, that, those were conscious choices that we wanted to sort of represent the character and what people were going through at that time. Yes, conscious. Yeah. Okay, so um, what you're going to do is you're going to ask two questions. Yes. An easy one. Yes. And a difficult one. Oh, the you mugs, you get them ready. All right, all right, okay. So, uh, a very knowledgeable audience. So be yes. <laughs> well, then. These might be too easy, these questions. I don't know, I was panicking. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say again, thank you so much for coming out and watching the film, and I'd also like to say thank you again so much for uh, Glasgow Fright Fest for inviting us in 88 here, and um, it's just been amazing, and you guys really run an amazing operation. Anyhow. How the fuck did you get that Blu-ray of 88? <laughs> that from, did you buy from it? The, the only place 88 has been released so far is in the United States, because they wanted to release earlier than everywhere else. And everywhere else in the world that hasn't been released. Not even in Canada. Mm. You want to see what the Blu-ray looks like in the United States? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Pretty cool. They went with this like yellow red. I think they wanted to make it look sort of like a killed Billy type of thing. Yeah. Cool. You got that from from the Amazon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know where to get it now. <laughs> All right. It was interesting. When it first went on sale, it was uh, 15 quid. It's now 8.99. <laughs> Snap it up! <laughs> we got again. I just want a refresher here. This is what someone, two lucky people, are gonna win. Whoa! The official hot dog company had me sort of gets in your eye, but that's part of the fun of it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So again, I'm just gonna ask a question, and then I'm just gonna the first hand that comes up. Don't I'm shout gonna, it out. I'm going to point at the person that I feel is the first. And if I'm misrepresented, whoever put their hand up first, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. The first question, real simple. Get our feet wet here. What? The heroine in the film. What were her two names? Oh. Gwen and Flamingo. Gwen and Flamingo. Oh, man. Oh, so and okay. he's got Blu-ray as well. Nice. <laughs> this guy's going home with this one too. Okay. Um, <laughs> you can't win. Uh, okay. Well, then it had to be easier. 
I'm going to go with, now this, one, this one's okay. It's still very achievable. In the film, when Flamingo went to the bowling alley, what did she order to eat? Red shirt. Five legs and a glass of milk. Oh! <laughs> oh. <laughs> His hand went up way before anybody else's, like Jeopardy pressing before the thing actually worked. <laughs> that was amazing. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, the European Family of 88! <laughs>